Unless you've been living under a tire, there's a good chance you're familiar with Group B Rally. And if you spend too much time online like me, there's an equally good chance that you've watched countless YouTubers scream about how crazy and deadly the cars were. But what you might not know is that Group B's older sibling was just as unhinged and came in the form of circuit racing. Group 5 special production may not have as many stories to tell, but the cars were mental. Everything from Corvettes to JDM Legends shared circuits across the globe with fire-breathing unrestricted turbo engines and aero kits straight out of a cartoon. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, the class regulations were less than two and a half pages long. So let's take a look at some of the rules and engineering decisions that led to these monsters and relive one of the best periods in sports car racing history. Back in the 70s, the FIA organized types of race cars with a group number. It was pretty straightforward, with group 1 for nearly stock road cars, and higher numbers like 7 through 9 reserved for formula cars. Group 5 used to be for prototype cars, but fans and manufacturers alike started getting bored of those when there were cars like these. So instead of trying to save the prototypes, the FIA said, what if we make a group for nearly unrestricted race cars built off of sports cars people recognize? The result was the 1976 introduction of Group 5 Special Production, a class that let motorsport engineers run absolutely wild. Their only limits were pages 227 to 231 in the Yearbook of Automobile Sport. So let's say you wanted to build a Group 5 car. Well, you could start with any production car that had already been homologated for Groups 1 through 4, so there was a pretty wide selection to begin with. Group 5 itself had no minimum production numbers, but you had to build at least 400 models of the road-going car, since that was the minimum for Group 4. Now let's dig into the rather thin rulebook. We'll start with the most subtle part of Group 5 special production, the bodies. Surprisingly, the shape of the original bodywork actually had to be retained. The original shape of the doors, hood, and trunk also had to be retained, although any choice of material was allowed for those. But here's the kicker. Fenders and aerodynamic devices were nearly unrestricted, short of a few limits on how far they could protrude. The result was the racing equivalent of Frankenstein's monster. Wide fenders, giant wings, and chin spoilers grafted over the barely recognizable shells of streetcars were the norm. But even with such a big box to play in, there's always someone who wants to break out of it. In this case, it was Porsche, who in 1978 built a car that frustrated both competitors and officials alike. In his quest for loopholes, Porsche engineer Norbert Singer noticed that there was no specification on headlight height. Since the engine was in the rear of the 911, there was ample room in the front of the car, so he took Porsche's signature frog eyes and dropped them down into the bumper. This small little loophole allowed him to completely flatten the front end of the car. But he didn't stop at just the front. The rules called for the original windows of the car to be in place, which they were. It's just that Singer's team designed a more aerodynamic rear window, which they placed over the stock rear window. So yes, in the name of sidestepping rules, this car had two rear windows. And while they were back there, they extended the rear of the car as far as allowed with a gigantic tail and the Porsche 935-78, aka Moby Dick, was born. But Porsche wasn't the only company to go all out on aero. Ford worked with German racing team Zack Speed to create a Group 5 Capri that was one of the most striking cars on the grid. In addition to Kevlar-reinforced plastic bodywork, the Zack Speed Capri had a full-on F1-style diffuser. In simple terms, these work by accelerating the air moving underneath the car to move faster than the air above the car. The end result is higher pressure above the car than below it, which translates to downforce. But the Zack Speed Capri didn't just have a diffuser, it also featured flexible side skirts that were designed to seal against the ground to make the diffuser even more effective. 
These would wear down as the race went on, but it made the first few laps in the Capri that much faster. And of course, a discussion on Group 5 body design wouldn't be complete without mentioning the Beta Monte Carlo Turbo from Lancia, whose fiberglass body was developed in a wind tunnel by the same company who designed this and this. Now, you're probably wondering about what's underneath all of the bizarre bodywork, and you'll be happy to know that the chassis on Group 5 cars were just as wild. Even though the rules called for the teams to use the production chassis, any material removal for weight reduction or modification for reinforcement was allowed, meaning that there was usually almost nothing left of the original chassis. The Beta Monte Carlo took a more conservative approach, retaining most of the center section of the original car, and then welding custom steel subframes designed by Delara to each end. These subframes were lighter and also gave the engineers an advantage for suspension design. Although the car's McPherson strut suspension type had to be retained per the rules, the custom subframes allowed for different suspension geometry to achieve far better handling than the production beta. If the boisterous body designs didn't give it away, Porsche and Zack Speed stepped much closer to the edge with their chassis. Both cars used aluminum tubing for the majority of their structures and roll cages. In case you didn't know, there's a reason why steel is more commonly used for roll cages today. Aluminum might be light, but it has a much lower yield strength and is a far more elastic material. Take one look at these chassis, and it's clear that they were built for speed over safety. I couldn't find any records of these cars rolling, but it's probably a very good thing that these cages were never tested in real life. But what were tested in real life were the engines. And I've saved the best for last because these were certifiably ridiculous. See, there weren't any power limits, just a little table that gave you a minimum weight required based on the displacement of your engine. So how do you increase power without increasing displacement? Turns out there is a replacement for displacement. Jokes aside, we really owe a lot to Group 5 Racing for the development of turbo systems in race cars. And in my opinion, two of the cars I mentioned earlier had some of the most impressive setups. One of the only constraints when it came to engine parts was retaining the same block as the production car. So Porsche started with their signature flat six and bored it out to 3.2 liters. Due to some reliability concerns, they actually developed water-cooled heads for the car. Hence the side-mounted radiators that you wouldn't expect to see on a 911-derived car. Parallel twin turbos stuck out the back of the car to let you know that there was some serious boost going into this engine. Anywhere from 21 to 25 PSI to be exact. This was enough for Porsche to weld the cylinder heads directly to the block to eliminate the risk of blowing a head gasket. Good luck to their service techs, I guess. Anyway, all of this was good for up to 845 horsepower in a car that weighed just 2,260 pounds, which put its power to weight ratio on par with F1 cars of the time. So just how fast was this thing? Well, it was fast enough to finish seven laps ahead of the competition in a six hour race at Silverstone. Unfortunately, the 935 slash 78 suffered reliability issues in other races despite its speed and Moby Dick wasn't exactly the great success that automotive media makes it out to be. Now let's talk about what the folks over at Zack Speed were hiding under the hood of the Capri. There were a few different versions of this car's powertrain, depending on what series and division it was competing in, ranging from a 1.4 liter inline four with a single turbo, all the way to a 1.7 liter twin turbo setup. Cooling these beasts were twin radiators that came out of a Citroen, which Zack Speed bent into shape to work with the aerodynamics of the wheel wells. Interestingly enough, development started with twin turbos, hence the dual intercoolers, which were carried over to the single turbo setup. These powertrains ranged from 380 all the way up to 600 horsepower, with the Capri's curb weight ranging anywhere from just over 1,700 to 1,900 pounds. Much more nimble in the corners, the Capri enjoyed more success than Moby Dick and swept the Division 2 title in the 1979 season of the, um, 
We'll just call it DRM. Now, big turbos on small engines usually mean that you're in for quite the kick in the pants. So is that the case with these cars? Here's a first-hand account from Emanuele Piero, who piloted the Beta Monte Carlo. I think it must have been two or three seconds from the time you press the throttle to the time you get the power. You could not really break that late into a corner, because just prior to entry, you already had to press the throttle to the floor in order to have the power at the end of the corner. So, what became of these absurd fire-breathing dragons? Well, the long story short is that Group B happened. Even though we all think of Rally, Group B regulations were also intended to replace Group 5 special production in circuit racing. Thankfully, Group 5 special production cars continued to be raced after 1982 in IMSA's GTX category, among other series, and many live on to compete in historic events today. No matter which car's engineering you dive into, there's really no denying that Group 5 was a golden age for circuit racing, and we'll probably never see a set of regulations like it ever again. So the next time you see a Group B car, don't forget about its Group 5 ancestors who paved the way forward. Thanks for watching.